where we are going back through, and I'm going to buzz quickly through the beginning because we just did last time we did a quick review of the, the areas we've been in theology, revelation, the Bible, and inspiration, trying to establish that uh, the Word of God, because this is our guide tool, if you will. It's the only way that we can know anything about God is to have Him reveal it to us. And so we went through a lot of study trying to uh, get that nailed down. And, uh, and so that was kind of where we've been going really quickly. We looked at the so what's of, of uh, one thing said that what we're trying to establish is the uh, that the, the scriptures provided by God give it the authority then that we can take with confidence the things that are taught in here and know that they're right, they're, they're really the correct things to, to believe and, and that this is what God wants us to know and, and, and the result is that he has a right to tell us as his hearers how we're to live life, what our attitudes and those things ought to be. So when we read something that kind of stings a little and flies in the face of what we want to do inside, we've got to remember who wrote it, what authority he has, and that sort of thing. So uh, in trying to, the next stage that we are working our way through is getting to know him. Going through, trying to understand as much as we can about a God that's so far beyond us, but it provides then a foundation for faith. And it provides that foundation when all the chaos breaks loose in your life, or all joy breaks loose in your life, whichever way it is, it gives a foundation that you can build on, that you can say, okay, why is this happening? Well, I know my God, and I know... I may not understand all the details of why, but I know what he is like, and therefore I know how to view this thing that's happening. So we are uh, trying to understand him and put some way of describing him, and the way that we've chosen to do that this, uh, this morning and in the next uh, few Sundays probably is to look at kind of two areas of God's person, and one is we're going to call attributes of greatness, those things that make God great, his spirituality, the fact that he is a person, he has a personality, he is a real person, not just a force out there, that he is life, and that he actually has life and is what is life, and that he is infinite, and that he is constant. That things don't change with him. So those are the areas we'll look at for greatness and then the attributes of what we'll call his goodness, which is kind of his moral uh, characteristics, his moral purity, the fact that he is holy, he is righteous, and he is justice. And we'll look at each of those and, and try to get a handle on what those are. We'll look at his integrity, which means that he is genuine. He's the real thing. He is veracity. I love that big word. He is truthful. That you can count on what he says is always being truthful because that is what he is. And that he is faithful. So that's another one you read about in the Psalms. My faithful God. What does that mean when we, when we say that? And then the other one that uh, is popular these days, kind of all isolated by itself, is God is love. Well, what does that mean? And we'll look at his benevolence, his mercy, and his persistence, which is an interesting one to have connected into the idea of love, but we'll want to, that's, that's about three weeks down the road at the rate I'm going, so we don't have to get too worried about that yet. So the first one we looked at last time, and I'll try to run through quickly, and, and hopefully I will stop at the, and slow down at the right place, so if I run past something, you're going, wait, 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 wait a minute, I don't remember that, way back, and I'll see if I can end for a slow down at this point that I'm supposed to, to kind of pick up where we left off. So, first thing that we looked at is that he's a spiritual person. I mean, he's, he's not made of stuff, matter, physical things. And because of that, he doesn't have any kind of physical nature, even though the scripture makes it sound like, well, we'll talk about hands or feet or something, but 
John 4.24 tells us God is spirit. That's what he is. Not, he's not a spirit. He is this thing we call spirit, for lack of a better term for us to understand. And it says, and therefore those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in another characteristic that we just talked about that he is truth. So we have to do it in the way that he describes himself and how you connect with this person. And you have to do it other than just with our physical, our physical stuff. They're not going to be able to sense him. So it requires something uh, that relates to who he is. It says he alone, in 1 Timothy 6, tells us that he alone possesses immortality and lives in this thing called, as Timothy describes it, or Paul does, unapproachable light. The idea that he's trying to convey is something that is so blindingly to your mind and to your senses that, that you can't see him or be able to see him because of the nature, our physical nature, is not able to look upon his nature, what he is, as he really is. And that sounds kind of hocus pocus, I know. But I don't, how, do, how does a person that's limited to seeing, hearing, touching, feeling, I think that's who we are. We're these beings that everything that we relate to is that way. How do you understand this thing called spirit? And the closest you can come to it is the idea of who a person is. I think we talked about that last time. You know, when someone is either in a medical condition or, or where their body is laying there alive, if you will, you've got a heartbeat and it's breathing, but nobody's home. If you get the idea that, that, that you can't talk to them, they're in a coma or whatever. You know, you see, they're there, their body is there, and yet, you know, where you go to a funeral and the body is there, but the person is not. And that's as close, probably, as we can understand the idea of spirit, that there's something within us, and the scientists will tell you it's all the little neurons that are firing around in your brain, and yes, that's involved in who we are and how our whole system works, and yet there is something in there that makes us us. Your neurons don't fire the same way mine do, and fortunately for you. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, everyone has their, their, their thing that makes them uniquely them that's not a physical thing you can get your hands on. That's as, probably as close as I can come to trying to get a grasp on that. So, no physical body. Now, here's where you got to put on your little thinking cap. If you had no physical body, what does that mean? means you're not limited to the things that this body can do. And some of us that are starting to put on a year or two are going, hooray for that. And I'm no longer tied down my desire to do something. You know, I want to jump off the tailgate of that pickup, but I'd stop and think twice about doing that. Instead of being 19 and just bailing off with the back of the truck and not even thinking about it. You stop, you know, you're, you're limited by this physical body. Not so if you don't have one. And you're not limited to being just in one place because physical bodies occupy space for that a little more later. So it's not limited to a location based on physical stuff. You're not destructible as a physical thing is. Yes? I, I, now this, I don't mean to be putting God in human form. Can't you just visualize him going, I got it. How do I get this across to these people? Uh -huh. no, that is coming out totally wrong. So no yeah, it, yeah, that's what we have in here. And a lot of times God will talk about himself in terms of a body. He'll talk about the hand of God moving or, you know, the God's um, characteristics in a way. You know, God sees you. Well, does he have eyeballs and look at you? And does the light bounce off his retina and go to like that? No, but, but the idea is that God is able to know what you're up to. Just as though he were sitting there physically looking at you. So he's able to connect. So that's, that's really the challenge we have in this written word is, is what we have understanding. So anyway, there's some things we're just going to have to go, oh, never completely grasp it, but we'll grasp enough 
that we can have a relationship and have some confidence. So then, and that's what the last part is, the anthropomorphisms, and there's another word that I forget, the idea of, of using those terminology that are familiar to us to describe something that we can't see. And we do that all the time ourselves when we're trying to describe something to somebody that they've never seen. You know, how do I explain to you a weird mode of transportation in the Philippines? Well, I'm going to describe it in terms of something you see here every day. You know, and I'll tell you that people travel on the railroad tracks in the Philippines on a little thing. It looks like a skateboard on a piece of plywood on a railroad track. And you go, oh, okay, I can visualize a railroad track, I can visualize a skateboard. It's crazy. Yeah, I know, especially when you need a train. But that's what they do. And then you put a little gas Chinese Briggs and Stratton lawnmower motor on it and you go faster. So, cool. Anyway. Personality. God has a personality. He is a person like we are. He is not the force be with you. He is not just something in nature. And that's one of the things we looked at that points to that is we don't have just the God of storms and the God of this. God has a name. And this is the, the one name that we pulled up last time is Exodus 3.13 where Moses says, okay, you're telling me and from the burning bush, remember the story of the burning bush in Exodus? You're telling me to go tell the people in captivity in Egypt and slavery there, y'all follow me because God says so. Who do I say God is? That's the passage. And God tells Moses to say, I am that I am. That doesn't say much for you, does it? It says, I am the existing one. It's almost more, I guess, I understand the Hebrew. It's almost, I will be that I will be. And that is the name that Hebrew people would not utter. They would write it. That's Yahweh. It says, I am. That's the fact that I really am is his name. So he has a name. And it tells us that great respect is given to his name and it indicates something about his personality. It says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. So the Lord will not hold guiltless anyone who takes his name in vain. So does that mean you just can't write it down? You know, some of them, that's the way they look at it. Well, you shouldn't write it down, you shouldn't say it. Yeah, what does it mean to take someone's name in vain? Well, what's vanity? <clears throat> Emptiness, right? Now, some people say, oh, this is cursing. Well, it could be included. But it means to take who God is as vanity, doesn't it? So if you say, oh, there's no God, I don't have to obey Him, I don't have to listen to Him, isn't that some of it? God says to the children of Israel, thou shalt do this. And they go, eh, no, I don't think so. Maybe they mean in vain, meaning uh, they're not wealthy, there it goes again. Yeah, it's, those I, are love that. I'll just keep my big mouth shut. Oh, I, I have that thought. It's right here. When it hits you, wave your hand and say it quick. Oh, something that would make God appear to be, uh, if you said something that made God look like he was selfish instead of you, you're taking his name so, for granted. Yeah, yeah, it's something where you make him less than he is. Yeah. Or, yeah. Thank you. It's also loss of respect. Exactly. Yeah, because the whole sense of that is. Are, are not respectful to God. Yeah. Yeah. This is your God. You should listen. In, in vain. Yeah, it's really not appreciating who He is as a person and what He requires. And, And the, the, yeah, the fact that you are a witness, you're a testimony, and so the things you say, the things you do, how you act, reflect on who you claim to obey, so if, and who you claim to listen to and represent. So if you are being a scoundrel, by, is that what your God looks like? So yeah, that could very well be. He says he won't hold you guiltless if you do this, so he's holding you responsible 
to understand his name, understand what it means for you and what you do, because to not do that is do subject to some discipline, I suspect. We talked about Hebrew names and how important Hebrew names are. And I, if you would like to pursue this further, there's a neat little article in Unger's Bible Dictionary. If you look up names, and it goes through Hebrew names and it describes all the different ways that they looked at a name and how they named people. And sometimes they were, it had to do with the birth, sometimes it had to do with uh, some occurrence that happened around things. A lot of times Hebrew names connect something about either the birth of the person and they connect it to God. And there are two names of God, Jehovah is one, and Elohim is the other. Yahweh is the Hebrew of the YHWH. Sometimes you'll see in your Bible in the margin or something. That's Jehovah is the way we pronounce it. We slaughter it probably. And then the other one, Elohim. So when you see someone with a name with L on the end of it, that's usually a reference. That's not just that. Just Samuel, you know, doesn't just happen to be the name. Often, L is telling you that it's something related to God. It will be son, a son of God or a follower of God or a something of God or chosen by God. Those names will have something to do with God when you see the L on there. The other one is the J-O. They will take that and amend that into a name. And Joshua is related to that. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I have to just ask. Several times in the Bible, you know, God changes their name, like Precisely. Moses, uh, yes. or Abraham. Abraham. Abram. He was Abram. Yeah, and his yeah. name was changed to Abraham. And then Abraham meant father of many nations. Okay. As rather, the other one was just uh, exalted father or something like that. And Sarah was Sarai, Sarai, who was whiner, complainer, and she got turned into something. Sarah was, it's beautiful or something like that, isn't it? I kind of forget. Princess. Princess, that's it, thank you. So yeah, you'll see that where God says, because of my involvement in your life and your faith, I'm changing your name. And it's going to reflect who you now are <coughs> in me. When Christ is in you, you now are a new person. And there's that concept is planted early. As God says, I'm going to take you here over here. You may be an exalted father. You have no children. In fact, neighbors used to laugh at this guy because he said, oh, you're an exalted father. Where's your kids? You know? And then he became Abraham. He still didn't have any kids. So it must have been important for him to get your wife's name and children. Mm -hmm. And it must have been something. And they, yeah, they were thinking about God, or they should have been. And, and of course, sometimes their children were named, and this doesn't sound like a very good name. Like yeah, like Nabal means fool. Well, why would you name them that? Unless somewhere he acquired it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe he inherited it. Yeah, maybe he inherited it from his father, yeah. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel, which and L, there is the if right there. Did you catch that? Emmanuel, L, God with us. So, see, that's how those names, anyway, those names are important. When you read names in the Bible, they are often really important. And, and the whole point is, God gives us his name. And to a Hebrew person, him having a name means everything. It means he's really a person. Yeah, and someday you'll have, as Revelation says, you'll have that name written on white stone that nobody knows but you and him. So, that new name. So. And then, uh, well, we just talked about his names and things. A lot of his names, and when you take those, you know, El Shaddai and El, all these different names, their use of God, they often are related to something to do with, with men. And in El Shaddai, he talks about his power, God of great strength or strength or armies anyway but the whole idea isn't that he's strong over the storms and the stars and the weather though he is it's about his strength his power his protection of his people so it's often related to 
relationships with human beings. So, uh, and we, I think we looked at last time Adam and Eve in the garden. It says he walked with them. There's another anthropomorphism and walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. And God went looking for him and said, where are you? The person is looking for you, not the force is hovering out there looking for you. If he's a person, so what? If he is a person, then our relationship with him can have all the things that you can have with another person. It can have a dimension of worth, warmth, and understanding. The idea that you can have a friendship relationship with Almighty God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And he pictures himself as what? How do we pray? And Jesus taught them to pray that way, right? Our Father. And while human fathers are not very perfect and often fail and fall down and stub their toes and sometimes worse than others, so it, you know, but yet there is that idea of a father and a relationship with his children that's one of warmth and loving and care and concern and all that stuff that we bring here with it. So there you are. So you can have this unique relationship. It is not a one-way street. It is not a God pointing down and saying, you know, you just listen to me. <clears throat> While we have to be careful how we approach him with some respect and some reverence because also understanding who his person is, <clears throat> you can approach him. Isn't that mind-blowing? How do you understand being able to approach and have a back-and-forth, two-way conversation with the Creator of the universe. That just is hard to understand. And yet, it says, how did I write that? Probably oh, plagiarized. No. <laughs> While we approach Him with respect and reverence, He is a living, reciprocating being, one whom we meet and know. We can meet Him, we can know Him, like you know a close friend. Maybe better. And he is to be treated as a being, not an object or a force. He is not simply something to, to be used to solve our problems, to meet our needs. Oh, think about that one minute. When the children of Israel, we'll use them because it's more distant from us and doesn't step on our toes so much, okay? When the children of Israel were looking around and they were struggling a little with the crops and they weren't doing so well, and they looked across the street at the neighbors who were not part of the nation of Israel and they had 15 kids in their family and we only had four, and, and they're, man, they made 50 bushel wheat and you had 10, and their cows were having these great heavy calves, boy, they were weaning small and growing big and you were your little scrawny things were doing terrible. And you said, huh, what are they doing wrong? Or are we doing wrong that they're doing so well? And they went over to their native Palestinian friends and said, what are you doing? Said, oh, well, we worship God. We worship so-and-so. And if you take this offering down and you give him this thing and do that, then he gives you weather and all this stuff, and then you have good crops and good stuff. What's wrong with that picture when it relates to our God? That's a cash and carry respect. The cash and carry program. I love that. Yeah. But we don't do that today, do we? It doesn't say he can't provide. He does provide. But it's not... Oh, now I need something. I'll run down and put my quarter in the machine, and God will. And there are there are people out there that will teach you. They've written books. They're out there in prison them, supposedly, that says, if you do this formula this way and ask this way and do these things, God has to do something for you. This principle of who he is as a person says, no, you have a relationship. You no more get that than you go to your children or your husband or your wife or your good friend and say, hey, I took you to dinner last week and I did this or I did that. Now you have to 
fix the pair of coveralls I just ripped out on that nail. Because I took you to dinner last week, and so now you have to do that. How many of you guys want to volunteer to request that that way? Anybody want to do that? Or some other duty or thing that you want? No, we don't treat people like that. I mean, sometimes, yeah, we do, but should we? No, because it's a relationship. You do things for one another because you love each other. A huge portion of our population use each other that way, so they can't even understand the human God. And Good, point. Good point. Good point. Did you hear what Ray said? No. It says a huge portion of our population look at each other that way, and so how can we understand God? Good point. Because we do. People use one another. Let's see. I'll this person in the office, I'll butter them up and I'll treat them nice and everything because then I can use them to take the next step in the company. Or, and then once I've used them, then out they go. Oh, if, I have, if I'm a famous person, I have this beautiful wife, then everybody will think, wow, and it's really great, and I get promoted, and I get the, all the accolades and everything, and she's my trophy, and then when I'm done with that, and she's no longer beautiful enough, or no longer meets my needs, then I bump her, right? Yeah. I love you because. I love you because, fill in the blank. Yeah. And we do that. Good point. So it's hard for us then to understand that what God does is based on a relationship, and often it's based on a relationship where He cares and we'll, as we'll see, knows and understands more than we do, and therefore He might say no. Anyway, this last one really got me. God is an end in Himself, not a means to an end. He is a value to us because of what He is, not merely what He does. And then it took me to Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, and I read that and went, wait a minute. I think I've been reading that wrong all the time. And I didn't print it up there, because I'd really like you, if you would, to turn to Exodus chapter 20. This is, if you did ring a bell with you already, this is the Ten Commandments. This is the beginning, the first part, of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 20, and I'm going to start at verse 1, but we're going to read through verse 3. It says, Then God spoke all these words, saying, There it is, God said it, I am, heard that before, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. It looks like we would respect God and we would put no other gods before Him because of what He did for us. Isn't that way? If we read that as an American, isn't that it? God did this for us, therefore we would do that for Him. On the surface, that's always kind of the way I have to admit I looked at it. Do you know what I think that really says? It says, I am, and this is what I have done for you, which tells you what about me. What did they do to earn God's delivering them out of the land of Egypt? Nothing. Nothing. If anything, they griped and complained and probably did all the same things that we all do about the slavery and how heavy it is and how awful it is and how miserable it is. Being down here in Egypt is really bad. And God said, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out. You understand how much I love you and care about you, and I am the one that promised to your father Abraham that I would make you my special people. I'm still being faithful to you. And all this stuff is wrapped up in that statement. This is what I did, but what I did reveals to you. It lets you limited human beings look at something you can see that tells you about me. And because you now know me and what I am to you, it shouldn't be any problem to have no other gods before you. Because who else loves you like this? Do you get the, the drift of that? I always look at that as a command. I brought you out. I own you or something, you know. Shape up. And I'm suddenly going, oh my gosh. I think I missed the point. 
God must have gotten really sick and tired of whining and complaining. But he was still faithful. He was, he yeah. Was faithful to his, in spite uh, of what us. he had said to Abraham. He's faithful to us in spite of what we said, in spite of what we did. Wow. So, anyway, we're about out of time. Hey, I got a whole other two notches through the. We're going to be here a long time. Huh? Next time we will pick up one slide down from where we are. Huh? But God being life, we'll look at the fact that God is life, and we'll we will uh, see. So, what does that mean for us? And we'll try to see if we can dig into that one a little bit. Hopefully. Some of this, I know it seems like we're really repeating a lot, but I, I, the more I've studied this and the more I've read through it and tried to make slides that make sense and been forced to try to... That's an interesting process, by the way. If you've never had to do a PowerPoint slide thing, what it forces you to do is take something that takes 5,000 words and try to cram it down into one or two little lines. It's hard, but it's also a really good exercise because you really have to think about it. How do I distill this and make some sense out of a little thing? And you can see that it sometimes it's not real effective. I have to blab on up here endlessly to make sense out of it. But anyway, I hope it doesn't just bore you to tears or overwhelm you with this stuff. But this is so important. It has everything to do with what do you do when your son's tractor ends up in a war pen with him pen under. How do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that when your daughter gets leukemia and then you end up with rheumatoid arthritis and, and everything is going like that? Who is your God? And how are you going to handle that? And what are you going to live life like when those things are happening? When life is good, we can skip along and everything's fine and we can pretend like we know God and we're solid, but when all hell breaks loose in our life, that's when God says, do you trust me, Israel? When you're in Egypt, do you trust me? When you're in the desert, do you trust me? When the Babylonians are breaking into the walls of your city, who are you trusting? And I just... One closing thing that I want you to grasp. Do you remember the day that, that, that recorded in the scriptures when Jesus took his disciples and they hopped in the boat and went across the sea, across the Sea of Galilee, and they ran into this great big storm. And he's asleep, and all the disciples go, Oh, Lord, Lord don't you care? We're going to die out here because we know what this looks like. Our experience tells us but we're going to die. And he didn't say, don't you have any faith? Do you, know what he, do you remember what he said? He says, where is your faith? You all have faith in something. <laughs> their faith was in their ability as sailors to say, oh, the sea. And they said, we are out of ability. We're dead. He said, where is your faith? What have you placed it in? Well, if you don't know what we're going through here, you've got no place to put your faith in. It has to have something to latch on to. And that's what we want to give you in here is some really solid things that you can grab onto and say, I don't understand what this ocean's doing, but I know who's in the boat with me. And I know what he likes, he's like, and I know he loves me, and I know that he will never leave me or desert me, and I'm hanging on to him. That's what I want to give you. So let's hope we get there. Let's close. Father, we thank you for our time together this morning. Give us, Father, what we need to get sunk into our brains, that we know where our faith is placed, that we have something solid and secure to hang on to when life's difficulties come. Thank you for those who are examples to us, like Brandon, who writes so eloquently that demonstrates their faith as they are going through difficult times to us, that God is good all the time because we know Him and we trust Him. Give us a place to anchor our faith so that our lives might be glorifying to You, that we might have a relationship with You that is great enough to overcome everything else that might assail us in life. We thank You for our time together this morning. In Jesus' name.